evening, Dr. Lu. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everybody, on Sunday evening again, and it's eight o'clock. So I'll briefly open the floor and then I'll pass on to Janet for our wine webinar tonight. Okay, a quick welcome to everybody. And hello, good evening, everyone. Welcome to a note of Mandarin Wine Club webinars, which are co-hosted by Cambridge China Center, the Confucius Institute for Business London, Wine Peak, and CEDP Chinese Center, fortnightly on Sundays with our wine speaker, Jenny Wang, author of the Chinese Wine Renaissance. I'm Jin Zhao Li, director of Cambridge China Center. And the topic for the webinar tonight is also very interesting wine culture in Chinese philosophy and arts. And Janet will discuss with us what different Chinese philosophical schools say about wine and famous Chinese wine lovers and their artistic legacies. And it's great to see many old friends and new friends joining us tonight. And the audience at the moment are muted and we will switch on everybody's audio and video at a later part of webinar so we can carry on drinking and chatting. Now let's welcome Janet and hope everybody enjoy the wine and the webinar tonight. Janet. Thank you, Jing Zhao. Good evening, everybody. Uh, so yeah, so I think today we have a rather interesting subject, um, which is to showcase that actually wine culture is very much uh, ingrained in uh, Chinese civilization. You know, it's a uh, part of our uh, philosophical thinking and very much throughout the dynasties, it has always accompanied um, the artists, you know, in terms of um, their creative um, uh, uh, powers. <laughs> and arts, we're talking about uh, uh, literature, poem, um, calligraphy, and of course, paintings. So um, we're going to start today by first introducing um, the wine that we might be tasting together. Uh, so out of this mixed case uh, of wine, so today is our fourth session. Um, so we're tasting the, the Panda, uh, Jade Winery Gogo Pandat Merlot. And this is a uh, Ningxia, uh, Ningxia province uh, wine. I chose this wine mainly because, you know, panda is a, a bit of a cultural <laughs> cultural symbol in China. Uh, but we, we could talk about this wine and other wines that you might be drinking later on as well. So first of all, um, let's start with um, the hundred schools of thought in China. This is very important um, as the foundation of a lot of um, uh, the Chinese philosophical schools. And this was um, uh, a period during the, the spring and autumn and warring state period in China from around 770 to 221 BC. This was an, um, an era where lots of local warlords and hegemons were trying to vie for power um, and uh, influence. So these over, uh, overlords, local dukes, um, they wanted talents to serve them. So this made the environment um, very favorable for scholars and people with thoughts and ideas uh, to go about um, talking about uh, their, their, um, uh, what they've learned, uh, what they think will work uh, in order for a state to become stronger. Right, so, so scholars would roam around different countries and um, essentially self-promote their school of thoughts in the hope to gain um, employment uh, by a powerful uh, 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 local duke. Right, so, so this was a very special period in Chinese history where many, um, many schools of thoughts flourished at the same time and uh, people uh, were all encouraged to uh, exchange ideas and to form uh, arguments uh, and to um, uh, put their case um, forward in sort of public arenas such as wine taverns and tea houses. Uh, so public speaking, public debate uh, were the orders of the day. 
So if you went out、um, to the markets to buy your vegetable, you might actually <laughs> walk past、um, a, a open house, you know, a tea tea house or a wine tavern where there would be an interesting debate going on, right? So this was a very special period in Chinese history and built a foundation、uh, for the several thousand years afterwards、uh, in terms of the philosophical thinking of China. So, Zhu Zi Bai Jia, Hundred School of Thoughts, and Bai Jia Zhenming, meaning the contention of the Hundred Schools, because、uh, more often than not, the schools do not agree with it, with each other. They are trying to carve out their own arguments and own thinking, so they would、um, form debates、uh, and discussions. So this has an interesting parallel around the same, roughly the same time in the West.、Uh, you know, in Greece, there were also a lot of、uh, symposiums that were going on.、Uh, so symposia were, were occasions where、uh, people would drink wine and also have、uh, lively debates, philosophical debates, and often accompanied by、uh, music and literature, for example, as well. Right. So this is a really interesting whereby Western philosophy and Chinese philosophy were both flourishing around the same time. So yeah, so that's an interesting point to note as well. And actually, many of these schools originated、uh, from very practical、uh, considerations. You know, it, it wasn't the case that people suddenly just decided、um, to to to、uh, formulate very deep、uh, questions. <laughs>、um, Actually, a lot of them came from、uh, wanting to answer fundamental、um, questions, such as、uh, how do we better utilize natural resources. So some of the schools are very much steeped in uh, practical um, uh, uh, knowledge. For example, agriculturalists, right? Nongjia, Nongjia. Really concern themselves with、um, uh, farming methods, right? So,、um, in terms of wine, they do have some interesting wine, but their uh, overwhelming um, uh, concern was to do with、uh, growing food crops and ensuring that the people、um, won't go hungry, right? So, first and foremost, agriculture was around.、Uh, Um, food production. Only when food pro- production was abundant, then you can venture into the realm of put,、uh, perhaps making wine. Right. So agriculturalists promoted,、um, you know, the the the, the idea that、uh, wine should be a secondary product to、um, uh, abundant food crops, and actually they would agree that in fact, if we are,、uh, if the people were able to make wine, it means Uh, it means the the, the land is、uh, bountiful uh, and the uh, the regime is stable, right? To create this um, um, this harmonious environment for people to be able to have enough food to eat first, and then to have wine to drink. And in a way, that became a slightly circular、um, argument because a local、uh, ruler. Would want to make wine as a show of、uh, power and a show of wealth, because the idea is that、um, if under、uh, the, the a certain uh, ruler's uh, rule, the people were able to have wine, then actually it reflects very well on the ruler, right? And in a way,、um, wine was then promoted as a,、um, a as a means to、um, to offer tributes. Uh, in worship and in thanksgiving,、uh, because wine was seen to be an essential、um, uh, uh, show of uh, uh, piety and show of、um, strength as well. So, agriculturalists had an interest in wine in that regard, and then the school of medics. You know they are very concerned with the well-being、uh, of people, and they had an interest in wine from、uh, the well-being angle. So wine,、um, in previous sessions, we talked about wine being very much uh,、um, uh, steeped in uh, uh, Chinese history, med- med- medical history, in the sense that wine was used as a carrier、uh, for medicinal ingredients. 
or wine was fermented with medicinal ingredients uh, together to create a medicinal wine, right? And certain wines were prescribed to people with a certain constitution, right? So in a in a way, you know, if um, uh, if a certain wine with certain ingredients uh, served at uh, different times of the year, uh, you would expect a certain um, effect on the body and the well-being. Right? So the med, uh, School of Medics uh, talked about wine uh, from that regard. And then the School of Yin Yang is quite interesting. So they were very much concerned with um, uh, uh, essentially astronomy, divination, uh, and also um, creating and uh, refining the agricultural calendar, which again is linked with the agricultural year, right? So um, understanding, appeasing, and utilizing uh, natural forces uh, were very important in our, uh, for our ancient ancestors. So the school of yin yang were very important at that time uh, because it was seen as um, a direct link and understanding uh, to, um, to our natural world and to uh, please the gods and appease mother nature uh, were very, very important. And winemaking, again, um, also took a lot of lessons from the school of yin yang in terms of um, creating balance, uh, creating a harmonious and well-made wine. Uh, so the school of yin yang would depart certain uh, lessons uh, for winemakers, uh, you know, when to select certain ingredients, uh, when to uh, make wine, you know, and the, the winemaker also needs to be in the right state of mind, for example, and be aligned with uh, the, the, the yin yang, etc., in order to produce good wine, right? So all these schools initially um, had very practical uh, um, uh, angles uh, when, when they talk about wine. But then there are also schools where they were not so much uh, interested in wine culture. So two, uh, two very distinguished schools around this time. One is uh, Moism, founded by Mozi, right? So Moism uh, was a school that did not like um, uh, sort of uh, rituals and displays. Uh, they, they were not very much into uh, the, the sort of the show, showiness that came with wine culture. So they found the wine culture rather uh, wasteful and uh, rather hollow, <laughs> right? So Moism uh, kind of did not really like the ritualistic aspect of wine culture that was uh, prevalent uh, at the time. And legalism arguably uh, was even more against a wine culture in general. So legalism promoted the idea that um, uh, people must be heavily regulated by the rule of law. Otherwise, uh, people intrinsically by nature would behave uh, badly. Right. So um, many of the famous legalists enforced uh, prohibition laws uh, on wine. Right, so they would ban the uh, uh, drinking gathering, uh, sort of a social uh, gathering in wine taverns would be banned, and uh, private winemaking activities would be banned. Right, so for example, Qing Dynasty when it first came into power. Uh, heavily enforced legalist regimes and wine was uh, wine making, both wine making and wine drinking, especially drinking gathering uh, were banned, sometimes up to the penalty of death. So this, <laughs> this was very, very severe. Um, so Moism and legalism both didn't have too much time for wine culture. So wine culture of China really um, are heavily influenced even to this day by two other schools. One is Confucianism, uh, which is very uh, familiar to most of us, right? Ru Jia and uh, represented by Kongzi, Confucius. So let's first look at what Confucius had to say about wine. 
And this is quite telling in terms of uh, not only his personal beliefs, but also uh, the Confucian school, you know, its emphasis on um, on wine's role in society as a means to show respect. Right. So, for example, Confucius said that um, he does not drink wine that was bought directly from the market. Right. So, 沽酒食朴不食 which means that. Um, I will not touch wines that was not first offered for rites and worship, but was instead um, uh, bought from the market. So the idea was in um, in in Confucian times, wine was a precious commodity because you know, as we know,、uh, first of all,、um, it competes directly with food crops, right? So、um, people have to. Put extra effort into making wine after they've produced enough food. Therefore, because wine is so precious, it needs to serve some social good. So that social good, first of all, is to、um, offer the wine、uh, to your ancestors, to the temples, right? And the second social good is that it should help.、Um, Uh, cohesion among communities. So the second saying here, 乡人饮酒，长者出，斯出矣 So 乡人饮酒 is an old、um, community gathering of wine drinking. So Confucian school promoted this idea that、um, wine is like a, a, a good way for neighbors and communities to get together, and when Certain event、uh, occurred. The young young people should not leave until the elderly have left, right? To show respect. So first, let the elders have their share of the wine, and then they can leave, and then the young people、uh, can enjoy themselves, and then leave afterwards. So there's a social、um, hierarchy、uh, and order, orderly manner、uh, to drinking, right? And thirdly,、uh, Confucius said、um, there is no right amount to drink. I.e., there's no there's no、um, real point in prescribing how how many cups one can drink. Only that you should not drink、um, above your own limit. You should know your own limit and never cross that. Right. So, 唯酒无量。不及乱 right? So, Confucian school is all about wine's social utility. First of all,、um, and secondly, that、um, as wine drinkers, we should know our limit and be able to restrain ourselves. Right. So that is the foundation of the Confucian school、um, in terms of wine drinking, and you can still see that to this day. You know, we. Often、um, start a banquet with several rounds of toasting, usually three, right? So first of all, you toast.、Um, you know, we we say toast to the heavens and toast to the earth and toast to the elders or the seniors or to each other, right? After this sort of slightly formal toasting, then you can start to drink more freely. And Confucian.、Um, You know this influence is still uh, uh, still quite widely spread in China, but also throughout、uh, Southeast Asia, even right. So very very、um, widespread and long lasting legacy there. And this this is one of my、um, I, I find this quote <laughs> quite funny.、Uh, so Confucius. Said, <laughs> you know, we we often say Confucius said, and something very wise comes out after that.、Uh, but this, on this particular occasion, Confucius said, "This goo does not look like a goo," <laughs> and he was just、um, aghast by the sight of a ceremonial、uh, drinking vessel、uh, that was made in a very modern style to him. You know, it was not made in a classical style. So to him, this was a sign、um, of. Of, um, social uh, degeneration, <laughs> because people were no longer adhering to the classical mode、uh, of operation.、Uh, so, so again,、uh, during Confucian times,、um, different wine vessels、uh, were used for different occasions and also by people of different ranks. So they were very strict. Um, uh, um, Requirements around how wine is served. So, 
to, to Confucius, this was absolutely paramount that the right wine vessel made to the right specific, uh, specification um, was used for the right occasion. Uh, so when he sees a gu that was not made in a classical way, um, Confucius, was, Confucius was very displeased. Um, by contrast, we move on to the other very influential school uh, to the entire wine culture of China, which is Taoism. So Taoism, by contrast, um, uh, one of uh, its leading uh, representative uh, is Zhuangzi, right? So according to Taoism, yin jiu yi le, bu xuan qi ju, i.e. drinking is for pleasure, it's not for using the correct cup, right? So they are much more uh, free uh, in terms of how wine is consumed, uh, when it's consumed, uh, and how much it's consumed, right? So Taoism also um, have um, uh, lots of other interesting uh, ideas around wine. So, for example, Zhuangzi, uh, one of the uh, representatives of uh, the Taoist school, he once told an interesting story that still makes us ponder to this day. So he said, um, imagine a, a drunkard falls off a fast-traveling cart, right? And to the point that it was, uh, it was very high and moving very fast, if the guy was not uh, was not drunk, he would have uh, been killed, right? But because he was completely drunk and completely oblivious to the danger, um, actually his limb and his form were very loose and relaxed, and therefore he falls off this cart. He was only lightly hurt, and he didn't die, and therefore. Uh, the drunken state is a protected state. It protects you <laughs> because you are unaware of danger and therefore you are at your safest. All right, so <laughs> discuss, I suppose. Uh, so this was one of the stories he told uh, to say, actually, the drunken state is very desirable. It actually uh, makes you safer. It protects you because when you are highly nervous, you know, highly rigid, you can imagine if the guy was sober and fell off the cart, he may be uh, very rigid and would have broken the, his back, etc. You know, and and you know, would be ended up in a much more unhappy uh, state. Right. So this is an interesting story, and therefore, Taoist promotes this notion that um, the drunkard enjoys the divine faculties fully, right? right? So you are closest to divinity, to God, to the higher realm, you know, when you are in a state of drunkenness, right? So Taoism really endorses wine as a source of elation from the common realm, you know, our dusty realm of the world into a spiritual realm. Therefore, drinking is the closest we can get to the spiritual realm. And um, it's the state where we are most in harmony with nature. Uh, we are closest to truth. Uh, we're closest to the universe, right? So this is a really fundamental um, uh, thought that um, uh, sort of uh, perpetuates throughout Chinese history. And, and all the artists, uh, scholars, uh, literatis, they all really uh, um, like this concept uh, of the drunken state is the state of release. Um, it releases um, not just your nervous energy or your negative thoughts, but it also releases creativity. And so we have lots of um, uh, poems, for example, um, that were composed under the influence of alcohol, right? And poets and painters, they would often want to reach a state of drunkenness before they would um, they would uh, start any creative process. So, for example, we've mentioned uh, on several occasions poets such as Li Bai. Right, Li Bai uh, was called the poetry saint, but also uh, the wine saint, because he was very famous for uh, writing poem um, <laughs> under the influence of alcohol. And actually, one of Li Bai's ardent fan <laughs> and friend, Du Fu, 
who is also uh, one of the most famous uh, poet in Chinese history. Du Fu um, was a huge admirer of Li Bai and wrote a very famous poem called The Eight Immortals of the Wine Cup. Ying Zhong Ba Xian, and Li Bai was one of the uh, eight immortals in uh, Du Fu's poem. And to this day, we still associate uh, Li Bai uh, with drinking lots of wine and outpours a hundred poems after drinking. Right, so this came from Du Fu's uh, very memorable portrait of, of Li Bai in this uh, in this poem. And Li Bai himself also said things like, don't let an empty golden chalice face the moon. You know, he was very famous for uh, drinking in a beautiful setting, often under the moon or among flowers, you know, by himself. And he would um, uh, he would um, come out with uh, <laughs> immortal words, um, often with the moon as a backdrop. So we have previously uh, enjoyed some poet, poems by Li Bai. And so today I will just quote this one line uh, from one of his most famous uh, wine poems. And here is um, the influence of that poem, uh, Ying Zhong Ba Xian, The Eight Immortals of Wine, to the point that many painters have also uh, created paintings on the same theme. So this painting is by a very famous um, uh, Chinese painter, Tang Ying, or perhaps more famously known as Tang Bo Hu, right? So he uh, made a painting based on a Song Dynasty painting of the same theme. So in the old days, um, uh, painters or poets tend to pay tribute to past masters uh, by recreating their work, right? So this is a, a recreation of a previous uh, painting that he admired. And here you can see some common themes uh, of Chinese wine drinking in a sort of um, uh, artistic setting. So you have the servant boys, uh, preparing the wine here in this part of the scroll. So it's a long scroll, and these are just some of the interesting portions that I have selected here. And here you can see the servant boys serving the wine. Um, and uh, you can see on the right here, there's someone uh, playing a Chinese instrument. So often drinking uh, is accompanied uh, by making art on the spot, impromptu uh, music making. And here you have someone ready to write some calligraphy. You know, the, he's unscrolling uh, the, the, the scrolls, getting the ink ready. There's a servant boy uh, grinding the ink stone for him, right? Um, and here's another guy who's drinking um, and playing the flute. And of course, it all ends uh, <laughs> well, with some drunkenness and therefore this guy is sleeping it off. So here you can see some uh, details of interesting wine wares, right? So here's a um, uh, the servant boy pouring the wine uh, out of a pitcher. And here is a rather large uh, wine jar <laughs> and wine cup. And down here, this little gourd, gourd was used to also hold wine. So people used to carry gourd filled with wine, you know, on, on an outing. So when you see a gourd shape, um, that's also a, a common symbol uh, to suggest wine is being consumed or carried. And the, one of the other eight immortals that Du Fu mentioned uh, is a famous calligrapher called Zhang Xu. So Zhang Xu, so this is an excerpt taken out of that poem by Du Fu. Um, he basically described Zhang Xu <laughs> as a, an, another um, avid wine drinker. So he would drink three cups of wines and becomes the cursive legend. So cursive 
style is this style of free flowing very wild type of calligraphy style which you can see uh here you know as you can see that the writing seems uh very very uh, flowing uh very wild uh done on the spur of the moment and and Zhang Xu is the cursive legend, right? And after he's drunk, um, Zhang Xu would take off his hat and expose his head. So in the, in ancient China, you know, exposing your head in public is um, is um, uh, really impolite, <laughs> especially in front of uh, nobility. Right, but Zhang Xu doesn't care. Once he's drunk and in the mood for creativity, he needs to let loose of his hair. Right, and sometimes he would even use his hair as a as the brush, as the instrument. So he would use his whole body as the instrument for writing uh, calligraphy. And um, his swerving brush descends on paper like clouds and smoke, right? So this style of Zhang Xu's writing is literally like uh, clouds and smoke descending upon paper. So legend has it that Zhang Xu once composed a piece of calligraphy um, in a state of drunkenness. And on, on the next day when he woke up, he saw this piece of calligraphy in front of him. And he was like, wow, this is the hand of uh, divinity, you know, no human could possibly write uh, like this. <laughs> so he was sort of, you know, picking himself up, but <laughs> he was just really astonished that he himself could produce such uh, high quality calligraphy under the influence of alcohol and said, you know, no human being could possibly produce this. Uh, it must be done by um, the hands uh, of the divine, you know, there was like <laughs> intervention by the hands of God there. Um, so yeah, so that's that's a that's a very interesting story about Zhang Xu and how he uh, essentially made his name uh, as the cursive legend as well as a, a wine legend. So another great uh, calligraphy, uh, perhaps even more famous, is uh, Wang Xizhi. So Wang Xizhi's um, most famous work is called the Preface to the Or Orchid Pavilion, Lan Ting Xu. So this Lan Ting Xu also came about um, from um, some wine drinking activity. So on the occasion uh, of Wang Xizhi producing Lan Ting Xu, he and um, a group of uh, friends, literati friends, they went out on an excursion around um, uh, a, a, a festival we called Han Shi Jie. So Han Shi Jie was a period before the um, uh, 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 spring and clear festival. So usually around beginning of April. Uh, Han Shi Jie was when people would only eat cold food in preparation to uh, the tomb sweeping that accompanies the uh, 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 Qingming Jie, right? So Qingming Jie is the uh, um, bright and uh, uh, spring and bright festival where we uh, go pay tribute to ancestors. So before that, you would eat only cold foods. But in order to keep yourself warm, <laughs> to keep the body warm, and also to a certain extent to um, uh, um, boost your immune system while you're eating cold food, people would usually drink wine uh, to accompany the cold food that they eat. So this is actually a, a festival where quite a lot of wine is drunk. And people used to also go on excursions to admire spring scenery. Right, so Wang Xizhi uh, went out with uh, a group of friends uh, to um, uh, for a picnic by uh, the river, and they played a drinking game. So they would float um, a cup, um, a, a boat-shaped cup of wine down the stream, and when that wine cup stops in front of someone, um, that person needs to write a poem on the spot. Right. So after a whole day of reveries, um, they produce a, a whole collection 
of、uh, of poems to which Wang Xizhi wrote the preface. That's why it was called the preface、uh, to the Orchid Pavilion. Orchid Pavilion was the、uh, the name of the pavilion、uh, where they where they sat down. And again, Wang Xizhi、um, wrote this under the influence of alcohol very quickly, impromptu. And then the next day, he noticed he made some、uh, mistakes, basically, well, spelling mistakes, essentially. And so he re re rewrote the whole piece and corrected、uh, some of his mistakes. But what he found was that he could no longer reproduce the quality <laughs> of the original work、uh, that was done impromptu under the influence of, of alcohol. <laughs> you know, the second time, the second attempt, although he was sober and he was more careful, but he just could not find the same feeling and the same mood, and he could not produce the same same quality again. Right, so so Lan Tingxu, the original,、uh, became a much revered piece of calligraphy, and and、um, uh, everybody since then、uh, who is interested in calligraphy、uh, would attempt to make a copy of this, and this became the unsurpassable, essentially, piece of uh, uh, calligraphy in this. Uh, Xing Shu style. Xing Shu style is、uh, the running script. So it's still free flowing, but it's not as wild as the cursive style that we we saw earlier. And here's another very interesting and famous、uh, painting called the Night Revels of Han Xi Han Xi Zai.、Um, Han Xi Zai was a、uh, um, a prime minister. Uh, during the Nan Tang Dynasty, so Nan Tang was a small, well, not quite small. It was a kingdom、uh, that existed at the end of the Tang Dynasty and、uh, before the Song Dynasty. It was eventually、um, uh, sort of subsumed by the Song Dynasty. So Han Xizai was、um, was a prime minister、uh, who served this. Doomed kingdom, essentially, <laughs> at the period where Song Dynasty was rising up、uh, and just、um, uh, quashing all the low regional powers. So this kingdom,、um, you know, it was fairly clear to the king himself and to Han Xizai, the prime minister,、um, that the kingdom,、uh, the days were numbered, essentially. Yet. The king、uh, was not just fearful of the Song Dynasty, the rising new dynasty,、um, but he was also fearful of powerful ministers within his own court. So he was suspicious of people like Han Xizai. So Han Xizai felt、um, that he was in grave danger, not only because his country was at peril, but he felt personal peril、uh, because the king was suspicious of his power and, and his influence. So Han Xizai, as a、uh, as a means to、uh, mitigate the the, the king's、uh, suspicion, he decided to just have nightly revels, you know, with lots of free flowing wines and inviting lots of guests to come to his house to enjoy great food,、um, music, dancing girls, etc. So he wanted to portray himself as someone who cared nothing for politics. All he wanted was to live、um, a luxurious um, and um, Uh, carefree life for as long as possible, <laughs> right? So this painting、uh, was painted by a spy, essentially sent by the king、uh, to one of、uh, Han Xizai's night revels, and this spy happened to be、uh, also a court painter, you know, a multi-talented spy. <laughs> so. He went to one of Han Xizai's parties, and then afterwards produced this long scroll painting, portraying、um, his extravagant lifestyle. So here you can see, you know, uh, uh, interesting winewares of the time in gold. You know, you ha have servant girls. Serving wine continuously、uh, to to provide to all the guests who were just freely roaming around the place, and there were lots of uh,、um, uh, beautiful ladies、uh, who were providing music and dancing and and、uh, uh, lots of fine food, etc. Right, so 
because Han Xi Zai's um, show of uh, extravagant lifestyle, uh, eventually the king um, sort of uh, um, decided to let him uh, have his way and enjoy his days <laughs> for as long as the, the kingdom would last. So Han Xi Zai was able to essentially uh, save himself um, from from impending political danger. So this actually is a great uh, recurring theme in, uh, in, in Chinese culture. Many scholars or many uh, 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 government officials, when they felt uh, the time wasn't quite right for, for them to serve the emperor or to serve the court, they would retreat. Um, Sometimes, you know, by shows of great extravagance, but sometimes a much simpler life, you know, for example, they would uh, go live in the woods and become a hermit and enjoy simple things like uh, simple wines and simple food. So there are also lots of poetry and paintings depicting other types of uh, uh, um, scholars and uh, 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 sort of um, uh, politicians who retreated uh, to a simpler life. So the most famous, again, from, um, uh, uh, oh, well, from the, um, uh, from the Jing dynasty uh, were the seven sages of the bamboo grove. Right, so these were seven disillusioned men who would meet in the bamboo grove to drink and produce music and poetry and essays, right? <laughs> and they they essentially would hide themselves from the court and from the corruption, from the uh, political turmoil and danger, and choose to be closer to nature and in a way for a lot of them being drunk most of the time is a self uh, prever uh, preserving um, mechanism as well so when they're drunk they can't be taken uh, accountable for what they've said or what they've written um, or they are impossible to reason with and therefore they were by and large left alone so wine drinking and retreating is another sort of literary device uh, uh, in ancient China to um, to hint at a turbulent time, you know, uh, a turbulent time where uh, learned people have to hide themselves and while away their time and their talent in drinking, right? Uh, to numb, numb their pain and numb their sort of uh, um, uh, displeasure with the world. So one of the... Um, the seven sages of the bamboo grove, uh, Tao Yuanming, is perhaps the most fam one of the most famous uh, uh, wine drinker as well among these seven. And he's very famous for writing a lot of wine poems and also for making wine himself. He loves chrysanthemum, uh, both writing about them and to make wine with chrysanthemum. And this is uh, one of his uh, poems that I quite like, two lines, that says, After thousands of autumn and tenfolds as many years, who would care for your glory and shame? I only regret this life is too brief to drink wine to my heart's content. Right. So, again, he's, this expresses his um, resigned feelings right, towards uh uh, what's going on in the out, uh, outside world, the turmoil of, of the Jing dynasty, um, and the fact that he uh, could not really um, serve uh, uh, serve a, a good emperor or serve a better time. Instead, he has to hide himself uh, and uh, just enjoy drinks and enjoy scenery instead. And he would comfort himself in thinking that actually... Um, in the greater schemes of uh, things, um, history would not care for your glory and shame. So actually, it's more um, uh, it's more useful to live in the present moment and to drink wine and to enjoy uh, the, the the sensory uh, pleasures of the world for as long as you can for the brief time that we are here. 
right? So malt related to grape wine, I suppose. <laughs> Here is a rather famous painting uh, of grape and grape vine uh, drawn by uh, the painter Wen Riguan. Wen Riguan drew this um, uh, long scroll again, ink on silk paper uh, of vines and grapes. And this picture inspired several poets uh, in the Yuan dynasty then to write poems uh, about this painting. And one of the poem uh, specifically uh, imagined that this grape uh, was a type of a uh, white wine grape uh, called mass teat. <laughs> it's a long, it's quite a long elongated grape uh, that was used uh, during that time uh, to make uh, a white wine. Right, so there was a poem specifically saying how delicious uh, this particular grape uh, would make delicious white wine, and that um, is a is an imagery that came from this painting. And there was also a piece of writing done by uh, Wen Riguan's uh, student, and he wrote a piece of observation when Wen Riguan made this painting. He said that Wen Riguan uh, was uh, drunk and high on alcohol, and he literally just um, poured some ink and splattered them about on paper, and then afterwards made them into um, individual grapes and vines. And you can see how free flowing uh, the vines are in this painting. And it's done by a free hand um, under the influence, liberated uh, by the influence of alcohol. <laughs> so again, apparently this picture was also painted uh, under the influence of alcohol. And um, how about music, right? So in the past session, when we talk about history, um, these were uh, some of the slides I showed uh, during our history talk. And many of these um, uh, um, uh, poems actually uh, were, were closely linked with music making. So for example, Book of Odes, as the title suggests, Book of Odes, odes were usually sung to certain uh, familiar melodies, right? So Shi Jing, uh, the oldest uh, collection of Chinese poetry, uh, where uh, you first had mentions of uh, grapes and separately of wine, and wine used to uh, uh, celebrate birthday for elderly, for example, we got glimpses of that sort of wine culture um, from first from Shi Jing. And Shi Jing, many of these poems were sung. And then we talked about Lady Yang and how she was dancing while intoxicated. And she enjoyed Liangzhou grape wine in particular. And she would dance uh, to music when she's um, uh, mildly uh, inebriated. Um, and of course, Tang poetry and song lyrics and Yuan operas. You know, they were all um, heavily influenced and taken a lot of um, inspirations uh, from wine, right? So um, if you didn't see that uh, previous episode, uh, I would highly recommend that you uh, watch the replay uh, of, of the session, uh, session one, uh, which uh, where we talked about history and the, in particular some poetry uh, around the theme of wine. And of course, um, wine and technology were also uh, closely related. So, for example, the Bronze Era of China, you know, actually a lot of bronzeware, um, the technology around bronzeware and the design and the artisanship around bronzeware were very much uh, related to uh, the rise of wine Um as a ritual, uh, as an important uh, part of uh, rituals and worships and ceremonies, right? So wine must be served in certain types of vessels uh, for different types of ceremonies, for different ranked people, for different occasions. Um, they all demand different types of uh, bronzeware, for example. So the Bronze Age of China uh, had a lot to do uh, with the development of wine culture side by side as well. 
Right, so here are just uh, some more reminders of what we've uh, talked about previously, you know, different types of winewares down the dynasties. And then, of course, um, uh, tomb and war murals found in palaces and tombs. Um, many of them have uh, rich depictions uh, of wine culture. Right, so this in particular, I like uh, quite a lot. It's a lady in waiting with a wine pitcher and the glass, right? So the glass is very much um, an indication that it came from the Silk Road and it was used to serve grape wine in particular. Right? So these are some other aspects uh, of wine culture and the developments of arts and uh, crafts and technology, right? Along with uh, what we normally uh, understand as poetry, calligraphy and paintings. So if you're interested in this subject, I, um, I would recommend uh, my book, <laughs> which uh, does delve quite a lot into um, this aspect, i.e. Chinese culture and philosophy uh, and their relationship with wine throughout different dynasties. And also in each dynasty, depending on whether the dynasty is in um, uh, um, the ascent or in the decline, you know, wine culture would slightly um, change as well, you know. So during the height of Tang Dynasty or Song Dynasty, for example, you would have uh, poetry depicting, you know, a, a, a very vibrant wine scene. Uh, and, the, and the poems would be full of joy and happiness and noise of the market, you know, uh, noise from the traders selling wine, uh, noise from the taverns, etc. And when you have periods of decline, you will find uh, poems about, um, you know, lamentation, um, uh, you know, wanting to use drunkenness uh, as a means to escape, to escape sorrow or to escape a, a, a present danger or peril. You know, it's a, it's a sign of withdrawal. So that is very much tied with um, the Taoist uh, feeling um, of escape and of using drunkenness as a protective uh, state, you know, so that's um, a, a long running theme throughout Chinese history. So I will stop there for today. And um, next session, we'll be talking about um, Chinese and English wine industry, because we also have two English wines in our current mixed case. Um, so I want to compare and contrast uh, China and England as two very exciting new wine regions uh, of the world. Right. So that's for next time. And so here's a reminder of the mixed case that we're going through at the moment. Um, and they are available from the Cambridge China Centre. So uh, feel free to, uh, to go on the website and uh, have. Great. So I will stop there and we can open up the floor. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Jenny. Thank you. Such a wonderful um, webinar, taking us back to over 2,700 years ago, going down the history of the different uh, philosophical schools and the Chinese artists and great figures. Very interesting. And Jenny, did you translate most of the, uh, the Chinese po poems yourself? Yeah. Yes. So, yes, I, I did. And in my book, there are more as well. Yeah, that was one of my uh, uh, great interests, actually, uh, is to translate some of these Chinese poems, in particular, wine poems. <laughs> Wonderful. Book. Yeah. Beautiful <laughs> languages. Oh, thank you. OK. And uh, well, I'm switching on the audios and videos of the audience. Um, I'm going to carry on doing that. We have a question in the chat box. Uh, actually, I have the same question as well. Uh, Cai Xiahe um, is wondering, would that be spirit that 
um, people used to drink in the old days, and uh, like the higher alcohol, a uh, higher volume um, alcohol one instead of like what we think our understanding of a modern wine. Uh, yeah, well, fifteen degrees. So that's a really good question. So um, one of the premise, I suppose, I should make clearer is that when we talk about wine, I guess in in Chinese we, we talk about jiu, right? Jiu for us is quite um, wide ranging. Uh, it could be pu tao jiu, which is grape wine, or it could be uh, mi jiu, rice wine, or pi jiu, even beer. We we call it <laughs> pi jiu. So in the old days. Um, the most common wines, um, depending on the dynasty, actually. So grape wine uh, were popular essentially from the Han Dynasty onwards. But during Han Dynasty, it was only available to the, uh, the, the elite, you know, the royal household or the noble clans, right? It was not widely available to the masses. Um, but by the time of Tang Dynasty, grape wine was much more widely enjoyed by you know essentially middle class <laughs> people had access because a lot of traders that came through the silk road uh hu ren, hu ren, they used to come uh through to uh through the silk road to chang'an and beyond uh to and many of them sold grape wine right so grape um to suggest that uh, even a, a middle class family would be enjoying grape wine at this time. And of course, apart from grape, we also had uh, wines made from many other types of fruits, right? So, uh, you know, peach, apricot, um, you know, and uh, yeah, you, you can think of lots and herbs, right? So um, uh, herbs like um, uh, herbs and leaves and uh, um uh, all these things were uh, and flowers, of course, chrysanthemum or samanthus, because we associate a lot of herbs and flowers with medicinal qualities. So a lot of wines were made uh, for taste, but also for their um, their health benefits. And for different seasons, you would drink different wines. The liquor, the, um, distilled spirits, only became very popular. After the Yuan, uh, during the Yuan Dynasty, possibly uh, sometime around Song Dynasty, um, many scholars believe perhaps um, some kind of distillation technology were already available in Song Dynasty, but we don't know for sure. But we know that during Yuan Dynasty, uh, distillation, the technology uh, become, became much more widely known. Right, so distilled spirits that we perhaps today are more familiar with came in the uh, uh, Yuan Dynasty and became very, very popular ever since, right? Because especially the Yuan ruling uh, class of Yuan Dynasty were the Mongols, right? So they were famous for this Hai Liang, i.e., ocean <laughs> capacity, like the ocean, you know, that sort of drinking ability. And therefore, the alcohol kept on going up since the Yuan Dynasty. And kind of just stayed quite high <laughs> ever since, uh, perhaps to our peril to this day, <laughs> you know. So when we talk about jiu wenhua, the culture of wine in China, we certainly are not exclusively talking about grape wine, as we would understand maybe in European languages, wine, you know, by default is grape wine, unless you uh, specify otherwise. Uh, but in China, when we talk about wine, we're talking about uh, alcoholic beverages, including grape wine. And grape wine actually played a much more significant part um, in our hist his historic repertoire than many of us actually realize. Uh, but certainly it's not restricted to grape wine. It includes other fruit, other herbs, and certainly not always highly alcoholic spirits. Um, because even during Tang, Song, up to Tang and Song dynasties, uh, alcohol levels were actually quite low. Even uh, a wine that was perhaps today, you know, we would call nine or 10 degrees would be considered high alcohol in those days. Typically, uh, alcohol, sort of common alcohol, were only a, around three to four degrees in, in, um, in strength. Right, so, yeah.
cool. So, <laughs> is it is it everybody? Well, not everybody, but some of us drinking drinking. Yes, ah, I see. Paul, <laughs> Paul is drinking the same wine as me. I'm drinking this Panda. Mm -hmm. I'll go Panda. Art. Paul is giving it some up. <laughs> Would you like to say a few things, maybe, Paul? <laughs> yes. Um. Thank you, Janet, for that very interesting talk. <laughs> the wine, I'm very impressed with this one. It okay. smelled very good to start with, and then I think it's sort of developing as well through the talk. Mm. And on the subject of the talk, I had two technical questions for you. I've mm -hmm. forgotten the second one, but uh, <laughs> the first one was about the cursive calligraphy. Uh, would, yeah. a, would a normal um, Chinese... Mandarin speaker be able to read that or does it need training? <laughs> well, um, that's a really good question. <laughs> and actually we should do a, this probably isn't a question for me to answer because quite frankly, I have great difficulty <laughs> reading that piece of calligraphy. But maybe other Chinese um, uh, speakers here can, 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 tell, can tell us if they can understand that piece of calligraphy. <laughs> Cai Xia or Jing Zhao, what, what do you guys think? Are you able to read that? <laughs> no, frankly speaking, I think that is like a doctor's uh, handwriting. <laughs> if you're not a medical professional, maybe you're not able to, you know, to read it. So it yes. has to be a specially trained, you know, person to read the, you know, to read that. To be yes, honest, I think that, that's a really good answer, and that's a great analogy to a doctor's handwriting. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah, so the short answer is no, I, I, I personally right. can't. I mean, I can pick out certain characters, but it would be difficult for me to read that. <laughs> mm. My my second question, I've just remembered it. Sorry, I was just distracted by Robert Smith's amazing um lounge background. Um, <laughs> um, I was wondering if you would perform some of those songs for us. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> for starters, a lot of the um, song, the, the, the music, um, unfortunately, have been lost to, to us. Right. So we, we, we have a lot of record of song titles and certain uh, formats that the song would go into thanks to the the lyrics you know so we know the format but the tune I, I i think there are very few ancient chinese songs that still survive today um yeah it's a great shame because actually one of the classic t texts uh, of china china um uh, that specifically deal deals with music um, in a ritualistic way. That book was lost. <laughs> yeah. So, right. yeah, which is a great shame to, to us. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Jeffrey in the chat says, uh, trying to make <laughs> cursive writing, depending on how much you yes. do. <laughs> you know, the tip is to just make it up because most Chinese people can't understand it either. <laughs> <laughs> so you can probably get away with just speaking, just saying something with conviction. <laughs> yes. Um, Paul, Paul, I should explain, this is not my lounge. This is a, a virtual background. It's the <laughs> smoking room at the Oxford Cambridge Club. But, uh, <laughs> it's very, so. very nicely rendered, Bob. So yeah, it, it <laughs> I think many of us, you know, thought it was your living room. <laughs> <laughs> would, would, would that it were. Yeah. It's great. It's a great background, nevertheless. <laughs> the wine was very good, Janet, as well. Ah, good, good. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, yeah. So this wine, I think, I mean, it is fruity. It's designed to be, you know, quite a playful, uh, sort of approachable wine. Yeah. Um, but I do think it does have a bit more to it than just. The fruit right it has good length it has good balance it's got layers to it and it develops in the glass uh, so yeah I mean I've opened it for a few hours and it's still developing and still interesting so I think it's quite a nice uh, nice wine to drink when you are um, well with food but also when you're not necessarily eating you know when you're like doing this talk for example it's quite a nice wine to drink uh, um, 
just by itself as well. So yeah, <laughs> it's quite nice. It's quite nice and easy to drink because it's quite high alcohol, it, isn't it? Isn't it yeah, good? yeah. So so this is one of the thing with Ningxia. Ningxia, um, the wine. Ah, uh, yeah, it is. It's fifteen. Yeah, Ningxia wines um can get quite high in alcohol. Yeah, because uh, they a lot kind of smoother than that. Mm, yes, yes, it's very well made. I think yeah, to good. balance that alcohol, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you, Jeff. <laughs> thank you for joining us and that really witty remark <laughs> about cursive style. So yes, have a lovely evening. Um, can, I, can I just ask you? You, you talked about the the um, uh, similarity between the Greek period and the uh, the hundred schools period in China. Have you looked into that at all? Were, were the, the Greeks and the Chinese, did they have any uh, yeah. sort of between the two? And were they yeah. talking about the same sort of things? Yeah, so I did. I, I did look at that as a just a point of interest. And one of the, the things that was quite striking was, um, first of all, during a symposium and also in this type of Chinese uh, discussions. So there were several schools which... Um, uh, in China that delved into questions like, um, uh, you know, our relationship with the uh, universe, you know, and creating balance and using wine as an extension uh, to um, uh, to express uh, balance. You know, you want to be balanced, therefore the universe is balanced, because if you're out of balance, then the universe, you're causing the universe to be out of balance, etc. So, it does pose certain sort of ex existential questions that, you know, we often associate with Greek, Greek symposiums, <laughs> right? And the other thing that was interesting is this logic, you know, uh, we, we think about, you know, certain uh, fundamental ways of uh, making an argument, presenting an argument or debating and logic. Um, so we do have a school that also delves into the realm of uh, logic uh, and and philosophical discourse as a, uh, as a framework uh, to present uh, uh, arguments or facts or, or opinions, right? So that's quite interesting. And another thing that's interesting is both the Greeks and the Chinese have discussions about um, the, medis uh, the health benefits uh, of wine. Uh, both the health and also the the harm that it can do if uh, you overindulge, right? So, um, uh, Cato uh, the Great, I think, uh, for example, he wrote quite extensively on um, viticulture, but also uh, the medicinal qualities of wine. And I think Plato also delved into that a little bit as well. And that is actually a really uh, big part um, of um, the, uh, the, the wine culture in China is uh, its close relationship with Chinese medicine, um, not just to cure ailments, but actually to prevent, right, to, uh, to fine tune your body with the seasonality, with the seasons, uh, with the condition and with your own constitution, or that can be fine tuned and made uh, ha harmonious uh, by drinking certain wines at different times of the year or different times of the day even, right? So, yeah, so those are some of the interesting, I suppose, parallels you can draw. Yeah. So just, just sort of following on for that, I can just ask ask another question. Uh, did the Chinese have other drugs, other sort of mind altering drugs apart from alcohol? <laughs> mm. <laughs> I'm sure they it? must have. <laughs> I must say. I just wonder whether they was that yeah, the main the main I don't know hallucinogenic drug of choice or something, or or, or is that just one? Yeah, of, I'm it's... sure they do, but I suppose it's not something that. Uh, we <laughs> we are taught a lot in school, <laughs> so I, I can't, top of my head, uh, top of my head, I can't think of anything from ancient China. But of course, you know, opium was certainly <laughs> prolific during the Qing Dynasty, and um, um, uh, but yeah, but that's not something that we <laughs> we would uh, feel very proud of uh, or promote, you know. So, <laughs> um, yeah, but I'm sure there must have been, but um, um, you can, 
I, I suppose, I mean, I'm not an expert on Chinese medicine, but I'm sure the medical books, the ancient Chinese medical books must have records of certain herbs um, that would have mind altering uh, effects and how they should be used or how they should be uh, not used, etc. But it's not something that I've looked into. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> interesting, interesting thought. <laughs> Can I say something, if you don't mind? Yeah, of course. Yeah, please. I think you know what from the medical part, the traditional Chinese medicine, there are certain herbs can help people to get to people, you know, to the state like a little bit, uh, you know, overexcited, mm-hmm. and uh, in some of the treatment, it helps because you know it yeah. does encourage you know uh, the blood circulation and this it helps and yeah. uh, even you know for like especially for people in the old days before the modern you know medicine we used to use the jinsen you know rinsen and we use it to the jinsen to for the help of the people uh, when they really die and uh, they use the ginseng to help that and also ginseng has also been added to the you know the spirit and uh, to help with you know general health as well to get people more energetic yeah. so that possibly part of the thing there's another thing is possibly you're away is about cigarette because cigarettes does getting people you know excited to the stage that's why in the old days a lot of people like especially artists or you know uh people with creative uh, mm, uh, writing or you know writing a book or even like this they do go, need go to that certain stage to make them more creative yeah no, absolutely. Yeah, you're you're spot on there. Yeah, so I think yeah, medicinal book is <laughs> where we can find other wonderful <laughs> mind altering things. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of um, I suppose what we consider drugs in Chinese medicine, they would always say anything. Uh, we we have a saying that if it's medicine is three-part poison, right? So it's all to do with quantity and how you use it. Um, If used carefully and well, most um, herbs or most drugs or whatever um, have certain benefits uh, to the body. Um, Or if used in conjunction with something else, it would have uh, a different uh, effect uh, or efficacy. Uh, but if it's used, if it's abused, of course, anything, even even the best, um, uh, mildest uh, uh, herbs could do great harm as well if not used correctly. Yeah, so it's all about balance, I suppose, and um, and how it's done. Yeah. Um, Jennifer, hi Jennifer, <laughs> how are you? You're on mute, I think. Uh, I'm fine, thank you, Janet. Um, Great to see you today. Yeah, um, yeah. No, it's. Um, I, I found the question on a potential tie-in with the Greek uh, symposium uh, interesting uh, because there's, there's still research going on, isn't there, between the yeah. ancient civilizations and the crossover that took place. Um, yeah. So yeah. Yeah, it's always quite interesting to see when what's what's happening in different parts of the world you know and sometimes there's some un- uncanny uh uh relationships and things happening at the same time almost um and it's quite interesting <laughs> yeah. mm. are you drinking something interesting are you drinking the same wine as us today well i've i've had um, um an order that has already followed the webinars purely because i'm very keen on saving uh, the reds. Mm. So, um, That's I, fine. <laughs> I, yeah, the, the panda one I'm definitely saving because I, I do enjoy that so much. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's, I'm a, uh, my principle is deferring the pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But I think until you. We, and, until we can yeah. meet up physically. That's, yes. That, yeah. That's, uh, that's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you've had this panda wine before. Yes, I really enjoy it. Mm. Great. Cool. So Jing Zhao made a really (laughs) interesting comment. Oh, from Miss Lee. (laughs) 
wine has done so much for those artists has done none to me is it wrong with the wine or me <laughs> well you're not alone there <laughs> i think the, i haven't produced any maybe defective she should try another one <laughs> yes it hasn't happened to me either <laughs> yes great so um yeah great to see everybody i guess um if anybody have more questions or uh, comments about anything otherwise we will catch up again in two weeks time oh my phone is ringing too <laughs> <laughs> great so okay so shall we um call it a night and uh we'll meet up in two weeks yeah. great. great thank you everybody thanks for joining today Bye. <laughs> yeah. good night